God's grace and mercy and peace are yours in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Since we gathered in God's house last Sunday, a number of things have changed in our world with increasing concerning headlines about a virus and economic concerns. We gather today in the presence of the one who has power to control an even greater enemy, power over Satan, giving us confidence that he will care for us in each and every need and challenge. The word of our God that we consider together this morning is that first lesson from Genesis chapter 2. How often do you think you are tempted to sin every single day? How many times a day would you be tempted to either be angry or to be discontent or to perhaps break the rules a little bit when you think that nobody else is looking? Or how often are you tempted to worry, to cross that line between concern to anxious worry so that you doubt God's loving care and protection. I think if we would try to add up all the times that we face temptation, we would probably be surprised that there is a constant barrage and bombardment of temptations that we face every day. Our constant ongoing struggle with temptation goes back to that day when Adam and Eve were first tempted. The one who tempted them tempts us still, and often we fail. The evidence of that is all around us. It's in the guilt that is in our own hearts. It's in the troubles and the sadness and the sickness in the world around us. It's even in the cemeteries of our world that one day must make a place for us too. But God has not left us alone and defeated. Instead, in mercy, he sends us a victor who provides strength in each time of temptation. Do you ever wonder why God put that tree in the middle of the Garden of Eden? After all, if that tree of the knowledge of good and evil had not been there, Adam and Eve would not have sinned, and our world might still be perfect. So why was it there? Well, God did not create Adam and Eve to be some kind of robots whose every action and decision was pre-programmed by God. Instead, he created them in his image. He made them holy and sinless. They had perfect ability to always obey God. They had something that no other human being has ever had. They had free will. They were perfectly able to obey God. They knew the ability to consciously choose to do what is right, and they knew the joy of always doing what was right. And they did that for a little while until that day that Satan began a conversation with them about that tree. Now, the devil had been created as a good angel, but then he chose somehow to rebel against God. And he brought that rebellion to the earth first in the form of a very carefully crafted question. Did God really say You can't eat from any of these trees in the garden. Now, he wanted them to think it was an easy question so that they would perhaps think that he wasn't much of a threat at all. But his question began to plant a little doubt. Well, What kind of God would create all of these wonderful things and not let them enjoy them? Eve answered that first question correctly, stating that there was only one tree that was off limits for them, and if they ate from it, they would die. 
You will not die, the devil said. Did you catch that? He said the exact opposite of what God had said. He clearly lied. But somehow it didn't seem like that. Because he was telling them that he could offer them something better. They could be like God if they would only eat from that tree. He suggested that God was keeping something good from them. That he was placing unnecessary restrictions on them. And that their lives could be better. That they could have far more potential if they just ate from that tree. There was one thing that God had not given to Adam and Eve. And that was equality with him. The devil tempted them to desire that and to try to get that for themselves. Now there are some who scoff at this whole account saying, is this really all about a piece of fruit? What kind of God would get so upset about something so trivial? But this is not just about a bite of fruit. Adam and Eve decided they wanted to be their own God. They decided that no longer were they interested in living for God. They would live for themselves. That choice that Adam and Eve made is the same one that we make each time we sin. The sin or sin is always the sinner saying to God, God, I'm going to do this my way, not your way. And that thought is appealing to us because of what happened that day in the garden. When Adam and Eve sinned, they lost the image of God. They were no longer holy and sinless. And after they sinned, their children who were born to them were born sinful. The same is true for all of us. Psalm 51, it says, Surely I was sinful at birth. And so nobody has to teach us when we are little how to get angry or how to be selfish or how to take a toy away from another child. And when we get older and bigger and stronger, we figure out more effective ways of hurting others and more emphatic ways of saying, God, I'm going to do this my way. And the devil encourages that every time he tempts. He still uses those same kinds of lies. He'll say, God doesn't really mean that. Nobody can avoid lustful thoughts, so don't worry about that. Or you can't be honest all the time, not when others are constantly cutting corners. Or he comes with his empty promises, saying something like, well, God wants you to be happy, right? So you can go ahead and bend his rules a little bit if that's what works best for you, if that's what makes you happy. The devil's promises sound so appealing. But we all know that empty feeling that comes from Satan not being able to deliver what he promises. The devil is never our friend. The Bible rightly calls him the enemy, the accuser. He accuses God of being unreasonable with his laws. And then, when we sin, he accuses us, saying, Do you think God can love you now? Aren't you too sinful for that? There's only one thing that can silence the accusations of Satan. And it's not our promises to try to do better the next time. It's not our efforts to try to make up for wrongs in the past by doing good now. There's only one thing that can cast a shadow over Satan and silence his accusations. And do you know what that is? It is the cross. Because on the cross is the one who overcame every temptation of Satan. Earlier in Jesus' ministry, for 40 days, the devil tried his normally deadly deceptions 
upon Jesus. He said, Jesus, your life should be better. If you're the son of God, you shouldn't be hungry. So tell that stone to turn into a loaf of bread. Jesus said he would not listen to Satan's voice, but to the voice of his father who said, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Satan tried again. Jesus, your heavenly father promises that he will protect you from every danger with his angels. Show everybody how that works. Jump down from the highest wall of the temple. Jesus said we are never to twist scripture to suit our own wishes. And then he responded by saying, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And then Satan led him up a high hill and showed him all the kingdoms of the earth and promised to give them all to Jesus with just one condition. If Jesus would just bow once to worship him. Now we might think that would have been an easy one for Jesus to reject. But he was promising Jesus an easy way to glory. Jesus, you can skip the suffering. Jesus, there's no need for you to give up your life on a cross, not for a world of sinners who so often won't even appreciate what you've done. Jesus replied, again with a scripture verse, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Satan was promising happiness this way and that way, every other way than, than God's way. But Jesus exposed his lies. Jesus did what Adam and Eve did not do. Jesus did what you and I cannot do. He perfectly overcame every temptation, perfectly obeying his heavenly Father's will. And he didn't need to do that for himself. He did that for you and he did that for me. Jesus defeated Satan's temptations. But to fully overcome his power, Jesus had to do even more than avoid every sin and always do what is right. He had to be nailed to the cross for our failures in temptation. Do you remember how the Bible calls the devil the accuser? Because of Jesus' cross, those accusations have been silenced. No longer can the devil point right at you and say, Sinner, you don't deserve God's love. There's no hope for you. The devil can't say that anymore because Jesus steps to your side and he says, Devil, their sins are on me. I carried them all to the cross. I paid for them in full. They are gone. Satan, you must. Be silent. The Bible explains that in the book of Revelation. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb. By faith in Jesus' payment for every sin, each believer receives forgiveness and victory over Satan. In Jesus Child of God, you now have freedom. Not freedom to live your own way, but freedom to live for your Savior. God counts your sins against you no more. God in mercy gives you his gifts of forgiveness and new life and true freedom to love and serve your Savior. And your Savior who overcame Satan has strength for you whenever you are tempted. And we know that is so often. And the devil knows exactly which temptations are most troublesome for each of us. But did you know we don't have to let him win? You are able to not sin. Now, that's not by our own power. But it's because of the power that Jesus entrusts to us. Do you know what that power is? Well, think of the weapon that Jesus used to overcome each temptation of Satan. He used the Word of God. 
The Bible is called the sword of the Spirit, the only power that is strong enough to make Satan back away. Think of a couple of examples. Do you have to get upset and complain when your mom or dad asks you to do something? Or can you just lovingly obey? Do you have to get angry about something that seems unfair or unkind? Or can you, with patience, humbly bear that cross? Do you have to watch something that makes fun of God's will on a favorite television show? Now, we admit we don't have to do those things, but, but then often we quickly say, well, well, we can't be perfect. Who can do that? No, you're right. We cannot be perfect, but we can. We can do better with God's help. We can do better with God's help. The help that he gives to us in his holy word, which guides us in his truth and strengthens us in, his, in faith to love and serve him. And we can use that word if we know it. And so that is why we gather in God's house to hear and to learn his word. That is why we have the opportunity to gather together with fellow believers to be encouraged in the truth and to encourage one another. Because there it is that we receive strength to more follow our Savior who overcame Satan for us. We must fortify ourselves every day with this strength so that we don't grow tired or give up until we are safely home in heaven where the devil can tempt us no more. In this life, though, the devil's never going to get tired <clears throat> of tempting us, so often in so many ways. But remember, your Savior, who overcame the devil, will never get tired of helping you when you are tempted. Jesus gives you strength to face each temptation. Amen. I invite you to stand. And the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.